Mm-hmm. Good. So we've got a number of questions. We could mix up together. Good. Firstly, the man is not composed of the soul alone. There's a great difference between soul and the spirit. Now, the soul is your subtle body. Man is made up of three aspects, the physical body, subtle body, and the spirit. Now, it is the subtle body empowered by the spirit, or the energy, the everlasting, ever-existing, eternal energy that empowers the subtle body, and that is what is called soul. So, the spirit itself, as I said this morning, I think, is totally pure and neutral. It is not affected by any doings of the soul, because one of the embodiments of the soul are the thought forces which incorporates the conscious mind. Uh, the con- uh, the subconscious mind. So the soul that leaves the body, when the soul sheds the body, the body is just a piece of wood, it's worth nothing. And uh, if you would like to have your body uh, evaluated after it is dead, the comical, the chemical compounds would be worth a, do- a dollar and a quarter, and perhaps because inflation it might be worth two dollars. Fine. So the body is worth nothing then. But then the soul carries on, which has the subconscious mind, the thought patternings in it, or the mental body, if you wish to call it that, uh, empowered to repeat again with that eternal force, the spirit. Now, as everything wants to find expression all the time, what does the soul do? It cannot remain in limbo. It does not go into any plane of existence, as certain teachings would say. Uh, For example, theosophists or Alice Bailey's teachings or people like that. There's no place of existence where it goes, because existence is everywhere, and therefore that soul in its individual form is everywhere, being at one mint, atoned, atonement at one mint with the spirit. But that little bubble called the soul has to find expression, and it has a purpose, its direction, is to become one with the pond. It has to burst. The reason why there are so many different individuals with different different characteristics is like the different currents or energies contained in the bubble, the currents and air levels. So one bubble would be larger, while another would be smaller. Mm. So, In that other plane of existence, for lack of a better word, the soul evaluates itself. For in that plane of existence, there is no evolution at all. There is only evaluation. For example, if you go to a medium and the medium says, Oh, I've contacted Auntie Matilda on the other side, and she sends your love and best wishes, that is plain uh, rubbish. I nearly used another word. (laughs) It is plain rubbish. The soul there is too busy evaluating itself to take rebirth, not necessarily on this planet, for there are other worlds that are like ours, very, very similar in nature thousands and thousands of them. So they are busy evaluating themselves to take birth again, and they have to wait for a period, um, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 200 years, 2,000 years to be born again in order to find the proper genetic combination for which it has to be born through. Right. Now, there are two kinds of people that don't take rebirth 
very early. One is the very evil, and the one is the very good. Because there are no people that are so, so evil where a Hitler can take birth again very quickly. And there's no people so, so good where a Buddha, Krishna, or a Christ can take birth again. Hmm? Talking of Hitler, Hitler went to a fortune teller and he asks the fortune teller, uh, when will I die? Hmm? He was a very worried man. He wanted to know from the fortune teller, when will I die? So the fortune teller looks into her crystal ball and says, oh, I've got it, Herr Hitler, uh, when you're going to die. When you die, it is going to be a Jewish holiday. You will die on a Jewish holiday. <laughs> it has to be. The Jews celebrated when he died. <laughs> hmm? say. So in this, so the point to remember is this, that the parents don't choose you, but you choose your parents. Hmm? You choose your parents. Today's generation uh, will tell you, um, I didn't ask to be born. You know, when you rebuke them or reprimand them. But little do they realize that they themselves have chosen the parents. The chromosomic or genetic combination was just right for them to find their parents as vehicles. So what is their duty? They, they do not owe their parents any favors at all. But they owe the favor, the pain and the agony the parents went through. They owe that favor to the children that they will bring into the world. Hmm. You see a different way of love looking at it. Hmm? Therefore, parents should never feel disappointed if their children do not work out according to their own expectation and ideals. Hmm? But the duty they have to do in life is to do what was done to them by their parents brought them up with such great care, so they bring up their children by great care. And that is how it is balanced off. Uh, there have been books written recently about life after death mm, by some doctors who made some researches, and uh, they've made some uh, terrible mistakes. I read those books. They were not accurate. The reports were accurate where so many people on the brink of death or nearly coming back from death, um, they described certain experiences. And the most common experience was this, that what uh, that they seemed to go through a tunnel and on the other side a light came forward to meet them. Hmm? Now what actually happens there is this, that the impression they are getting, that they are going through a tunnel, is you yourself going through the conscious mind and the subconscious layers of the mind to the superconscious layer. It is sort of receding to your primal self, and that seems to you to be a tunnel. And the light does not come to you, but it is your inner light, the spirit, that you behold hmm? at the time of death. But of course, these doctors could not experience that, explain that because they have not died the way I have died. I could die at will and come to life again at will. See? So, everything you'd hear from me, they might be very revolutionary ideas, but they are not from books. They are from my own personal experiences. So, uh, the mediums coming back to that, they say Auntie Matilda is uh, sending regards to you and she's very well. That's all nonsense. Auntie Matilda might be waltzing away, waltzing Matilda, huh? and having a good old time there. She's not concerned about you. But you have to be concerned about yourself that what should I do with this bubble that surrounds me, the life force, the 
current created within the divinity of this vast pond. Hmm? What shall I do with that air bubble? I am entrapped in there. Hmm? And to find release, you would want that bubble to shatter. The covering is the ego, and you want that ego covering of the bubble to merge back into the pond and become one with the maker, or to become one with divinity. And to quote the words of Christ, I and my Father are one. And that is a possibility for each and every person. Mm -hmm. I do believe very much, not in Jesus, but in Christ. Because Christhood is a stage that everyone must reach in order to become one with the Father. And everyone has the potential only that we have built these walls around our hearts. And when I say heart, I mean the inner core of one's personality. And through spiritual practices, all you need is to chop away one brick and the flood of divinity will do its work and break down all the other bricks so it will flood your life in its effulgence and then you find that beautiful joy and everything becomes totally, totally joyous and splendid. And this joy is not pleasure because pleasure is temporary. Pleasure is always allied with pain. Hmm? Pleasure is always allied with pain. For if one week you have a high, be sure to know the next week you'd have a low. Because pleasure and pain are matters dealing only with the surface level of the mind and the subconscious mind. So one has to rise above that and the usual analogy I love is, life is like a seesaw up and down all the time. But when you approach the center, the seesaw stands still. And approaching the center means reaching the center of yourself, where you find total equilibrium. For is that not what we seek? Equilibrium, balance where the emotions don't run away with us, or where negative thoughts don't run away with us. Hmm? And these negative thoughts, as the question asked, are created by oneself. Divinity is not responsible for your negative thoughts, although the same energy is used in everything negativity or in positivity. And therefore, uh, people that teach of morality and, and of ethics ask you to live a certain kind of life. Thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do this. Hmm? Uh, the school teacher asked one of the boys in the class, give me one commandment that has only four words in it. So the smart little lad gets up and he says, keep off the grass. <laughs> and talking of commandments, this uh, minister, church minister, was posting a Bible. He made a nice parcel and took it to the post office. So the, the, the post clerk, or do you say clerk in Canada? Clerk? Clerk? We say clerk in England. Uh, the postal clerk uh, asks, sir, is there anything breakable in here, in this parcel? So he says, yes, there is, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so to find a release from negativity is not by thinking of negativity. If you are feeling ill, and this has been demonstrated by Emil Coué in France, in his clinics there, that if you are ill and you say, I'm ill, I'm ill, I'm ill, I'm ill, you will become more and more ill because your mind is involved in illness. Hmm? 
But if you say to yourself, affirm to yourself that I'm getting stronger and stronger day by day, I'm feeling better and better, and you will feel better because the very illness or negativity that you're suffering is created by your mind. It is patterned to illness. Now, when you re-pattern it to its opposite, of course, first neutralizing it, as I explained this morning, and re-patterning it to health, you will become healthy. So we are up against that ego self again, the mind which we call the cunning animal. We're up against that all the time and all the miseries in the world come about because of the machinations and the turbulence it creates by the ego self where you say, I am John, I am Jack, I am Jean, I am Jill, or whatever. Who are you? Hmm? 4,000 million people on this earth, hmm? and this earth, compared to the universe, is not even a speck of dust, and 4,000 million people on it, thinking that they are the center of the universe. Hmm? Just imagine. Look at the logic of it. Is there any logic, really? Talking of logic, it reminds me, this wife went to the husband and tells the husband, uh, darling, would you um, lend me $20? But just give me 10 now. Fine. So he gave her $10. So she says, well, you owe me 10, because she only took 10. You owe me 10, and I owe you 10, so we square. <laughs> that's, that's how logic works, you see. Let's see if I can't find another joke here while we're on it. And, you know, the logic of some people, really wonderful. So here this uh, meditator lady... Um, husband's birthday had just passed. So I says, what did you give Charles for a birthday present? So, of course, Charles loved smoking those big Churchillian cigars. Very expensive. Uh, so she says, um, I gave him a hundred cigars. I said, oh, that must have cost you a fortune, a hundred cigars of that kind. After all, you haven't got an uncle in the business. So she said, no, I got the hundred cigars for nothing. I said, now, how did you do that? Uh, here I, uh, you know, um, never mind, travel thousands and thousands of miles and bleed my brains out and lungs out, and I don't know how to get anything for nothing. How, how did you get a, a hundred cigars for nothing? So she explains me. She says, what I did every day was this, that out of his box... I took out one or two cigars, you know, over a period of several months. Hmm? And then, when his birthday came, I parceled them nicely and gave it to him as a present. And do you know what? He was so delighted that I got the right brand. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, so here this negativity. We all want to get rid of the negativity within ourselves. And the only way, negativity means fragmentation. It is fragmentation that creates the turmoil and turbulence in our minds, which in turn produces all kinds of negativities. So you cannot get rid of negativity by negativity. You can't get rid of illness by saying, I'm ill, I'm ill, I'm ill. Fine, you got to find the opposite, and that requires strength. You got to have strength, and strength comes from integration where mind, body, and spirit could function as a totality. Hmm? Then we function not in fragmentation, but in totalness, so that every action becomes dynamic and worthwhile and pure. For we are then living 
in, a, in an expanded sense of awareness. Now we are standing down at street level and seeing the dirty streets around us or the unmown grass. Hmm? But if you stand up on a hill and look down, you have a beautiful panoramic view of the whole site and you don't see the grass unmown. Hmm? That's not mowed. And the sight is beautiful. What it means is this, that your awareness has now expanded where you can see and look at things holistically and not fragmentedly. You don't look at things um, sectionally. This life of ours is just a small little section in this vast continuum, infinite continuum, on either side, and we are just a small section, and our views with the conscious and the subconscious level of the mind is just limited to those views. Hmm? Right, just through that section. But as our awareness expands, then you have a greater and greater and greater view. And you would see by having greater awareness that your heart opens up, you understand the feelings of others, you develop kindness, you develop that love, the compassion, because you would see the person not only for that particular action alone, which might not be conducive to him or to the stability of society, but you would see deeper into him, and you will find that the spirit that is within him is the same spirit that is within me. And only when this realization comes will we really understand the meaning of that great injunction, love thy neighbor as thyself. Otherwise, it is just on the intellectual level functioning in the right hemisphere of the brain, which analyzes, rationalizes, weighs the pros and cons and the right hemisphere of the brain, which is connected to your intuitive self, is totally forgotten. So through spiritual practices, a greater coordination occurs between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. Hmm. There's a greater synaptic control where the neurons are firing at the right vibratory level and making the proper connection so that you function not only with this physical body and the conscious mind, but also integrate into it that superpower of the spirit and you become whole and happy. Hmm? You see. So, uh, it is not this little temporary pleasure. For example, many people are very stomach orientated. Don't eat this food and that food and that food and that food. And do you know, they go to all the trouble and all the lengths for four inches. For four inches from here to there. That's as far as your taste buds go. Hmm? After that, squash. <laughs> Drat, just from here to there. Hmm? And they fight over foods, and they fight over this, and they fight over that. They fight over all the momentary pleasures which are lustful. How many people really know how to make love? Very few. Very few. Hmm? A pleasurable thought arises in the mind, in the subconscious mind, whereby a certain action by copulation, certain pleasure was derived, and, and some external object stirs up that thought in the mind in the subconscious mind, which gets translated into the physical equivalent of it, and the action takes place. So, is this love-making? No, it is not. 
It is lust making for only the conscious, subconscious and the body are involved, but the spirit is forgotten. The real love making is where the body, the mind and the spirit work in a total harmony, such harmony that the woman is forgotten, the man is totally forgotten, and only a vast, only a vast orgasm remains. And after all, what is this universe? From the time of the Big Bang, it is nothing else but a vast orgasm. That is the universe. And you can experience it in a smaller form. Why not? And by being integrated, you would appreciate the vaster form of lovemaking. For what are two people really trying to do? Hmm? Two people that love each other. I'm not talking of attraction, hmm? because today you might be attracted to one and tomorrow attracted to another. Hmm? It is not the cute nose or the beautiful blonde hair or the shapely legs or whatever. I speak very plainly. You don't mind, do you? Good. I see the smiles in your faces. Fine. Um, you see that uh, your ideas change when a man marries a woman, hmm? uh, or the other way around. Uh, they might find the boy or the girl very attractive, and they do not marry the person. They marry the ideal of the person which they have formulated in their minds. And that is why in the Western countries we have one divorce in every two and a half. That's a ratio. Because people are marrying an ideal which they have in their own minds. They are not marrying the woman. They are marrying a mirage created by the thought forces in the mind. You form a certain ideal and you marry the ideal and after a while hmm, you don't love her anymore. Hmm? The attraction fades away. Like that in every material possession if you're driving a Volkswagen motor car, you get those cars here, do you? Volkswagens, yeah. Right, uh, so you hanker after a Rolls Royce. Hmm? Nothing wrong. Work hard and buy the Rolls Royce. But believe you me, after three weeks' time, to you it will just be another car. You get tired of it. Like a child, you buy the child a toy. And after a few weeks, the child is not interested in the toy anymore. So what, what goes wrong here? What goes wrong here? What goes wrong here is attachment. And those people you talked about circumcision, perhaps they did not like to be attached to, um, I don't know what they call the piece that's cut off. Well, is that what it is? Mm. <laughs> Good. So it is attachment created by the desires in the mind. The secret of joy is to have non-attachment. Now, non-attachment is different from detachment. Detachment is you are running away from the world and becoming a hermit in some cave somewhere. You are escaping. You can't stand your problems anymore and you escape away from the world. Hmm? But non-attachment means to be in the world and yet not of the world. Enjoy your mansions, enjoy your half a dozen Rolls Royces, enjoy beautiful clothes, mink coats and furs and diamonds and what have you. Enjoy it. Hmm? Enjoy it. Why not? But do not be attached to it. Hmm? It reminds me uh, of this woman whose husband had died. She was a widow. And um, so she was complaining to a friend that my husband left not a single penny, single cent in insurance for me. The only thing he left 
was a burial policy. Hmm? So uh, the burial, burial policy stated this. Is, so the friend says, only that? I believe he left you uh, uh, a lot of other money so you could buy a diamond ring for yourself. And does that? She says, no. The burial policy was for 5,000. 2,000 for the casket hmm? and 3,000 for the stone. And here is the stone. Attachment, attachment, we were talking about attachment. This old man, who, well, in his 90s, was dying. Hmm? So he's lying on his deathbed, and uh, his wife was there, and he asks his wife, Rachel, where is James? James is standing on your right-hand side. Where is John? He's standing on your left-hand side. Hmm? Where's Joseph? He's standing at your feet. Now here this man, he had his foot in the grave. He was just about to go, but somehow some energy surged up in him and he sat up a bit. He says, look, if all of you are here, who's minding the store? <laughs> he had a man dying and he's still worried about his store. Attachment. And this is the attachment that makes you get reborn again after death. It is attachment that makes you take life again to work off, work off those desires that are so firmly implanted in the subconscious mind. For these three score years and ten, which we regard to be a long life, is just but not even a flick of an eyelid. Entire universes, I said. Hmm? Thousands and millions of them are being exploded this very second and, are, and others are being recreated this very second. So what is this 70 years, which is supposed to be the normal lifespan? Hmm? Attachment. That is what one has to get rid of. For what can you really be attached to? You came into this world naked and you are leaving this world naked without anything and everything that happens in between is a gift of God. Use it wisely. Hmm? So it could bring joy to you and joy to others. Hmm? Yeah. So to find release from the attachment that is the goal of life. Mm. And if one does not do anything about it, such as spiritual practices, we devote so many times thinking, so much time thinking of the past, and we spend so much time thinking of the future, but we never live in the present. We never do. Study your mind sometimes, observe your thoughts, and you will find you're thinking of the things that happened in the past. It's swimming around in your mind all the time. And many housewives know that they wash the dishes in their minds ten times even before they approach the kitchen sink. Am I right or wrong? Hmm? Oh, I've got to wash those dishes, I've got to wash those dishes, I've got to wash those dishes. Hmm? Like that, we are thinking of uh, Auntie Mary, as she said a bad word three weeks ago, and we're still living it. Hmm? Talking of dishes reminds me of a little story. Um, husband and wife were in the kitchen, and the husband, because of his uh, kindness or duty or love for his wife, asked his wife, could I help you with anything, darling? Hmm? So... Um, she says, yes, you can wipe the dishes. Fine. It went on for one day, two days, three days. He was wiping the dishes, and he started getting fed up with it. Hmm? He says, now, I must find a plan how to get out of this which I've put myself into. Hmm? 
So he thought and he thought and he thought and some weeks went by. So one day an idea struck him. His wife's birthday was just a few days later. So he went to a shop and bought a very expensive dinner service of real fine bone china. And he gave it to her as a birthday present. So from that day, she did not allow him to touch the dishes. <laughs> yes. Release from life. You cannot release yourself from life. Life is eternal. Life is immortal. Life was never born, and life can never die. That which is beginless is endless. Shedding this body does not mean you are dead. Hmm? For even this body is indestructible, and science will prove to you that, that there's not a single particle of an atom that could be destroyed. When you shed this body, which are made of five elements, earth, air, fire, water, and ether, hmm? they all disintegrate and go back to their original elements. Fire to fire, earth to earth, dust to dust, air to air, ether to ether, water to water. Hmm? So even this body is not destructible. So I talk of life and not of death. Hmm? I talk of living and not of the living dead, that which we are. So spiritual practices are important. I said earlier we spend so much time thinking of the past and worrying about it. And that which happened three weeks ago, we are still reliving it here now, aren't we? And if we don't do that, we are projecting our minds into the future. What is going to happen? What about this job or that or this or that? A million other things. Mm. Uh, next week's party, what am I going to wear? You're thinking about it now. Mm. And then you try and dream up some beautiful party dress. And then do not be surprised if some other friend of yours has not dreamt up the same kind of dress. Huh. So we're always living in the future or living in the past, but never in the present. And that is what we want, to live in the present, for the present itself is eternal and nothing else. Hmm? The present is eternal. The word nowhere hmm? just shifts the W to one side, to the left. And it becomes now here. That is where a person must live, now here. And if you're not all here, then you must be somewhere else. You, must, you might not even be all there. <laughs> <laughs> the secret of life, the secret of joy, it's so simple. I have a very, very, very favorite saying that it is so simple to be happy, but so difficult to be simple. Hmm? Let me repeat that. I love that very much. With your permission, Mr. Circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Look, if they want to have their foreskin cut off, that's not our business. Fine, let them circumcise themselves. After the meeting, you come and ask me who invented circumcision. It was a Russian professor, but I dare not say it in public. He, I dare not mention his name in public. You know, the Russians are against us. I'll tell you in private. Uh, it's professor Kacha something off.
<laughs> You'll have fun with me, old chap. Look, you can you can discuss the deepest, profoundest philosophy, and you do not need to take it seriously. For our motto is life, love, and laughter. Live in love, live in this life, and let it be filled with laughter, over, bubble with joy, joy, joy. My cup runneth over. That is life. Yes. Yeah. So where was I, Mr. Circumcision? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. So, the, <laughs> so, so to find release, we only have to release ourselves from the bondage. It's like a silkworm. It spins and spins and spins and gets caught up in its own silk. And that is what we have done. In its own cocoon, it gets caught up. So the release is from bondage. By nature, you are freedom itself. You are forever free. Your spirit is free. It is shining as I look at you. What do I see? I don't see faces at all. I see little blobs of light, some bright, some dim. Mm, the spirit keeps on shining so beautifully in all its vividness, in all its glory, in all its power. I ran away from home when I was four years old in search of God. Hmm? I went from temple to temple to temple and sat at the feet of those statues and I found them lifeless. Hmm? After a few months, three, four months later, my parents found me wandering the streets of a village ragged and bare. Hmm? They took me home and what have you, and they asked me, what do you do? I said, I spoke to those gods and no one would reply me. And from then on, I found that if I really want the reply, I've got to search within myself for the reply to my isness to that divinity that I really am, the essence of my being. And so my search started. Uh, during days at college, when I had a lot of friends, I was very popular, especially among the girls. Mm? I was quite a nice looking boy, you know, when I was young. <laughs> And uh, when my rich friends used to invite me to their homes to spend the vacation with them, um, I never used to go. I rather used to trunge around in the Himalayas, meeting guru after guru after guru, hmm. learning from this one a bit, learning from that one a bit, learning from that one a bit. Mm, but it was not complete. The many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle were found, but something was missing that could not complete the whole picture for me. Mm. And then at last I met my guru, Swami Pavitranandji. You must really get a little copy of my biography that has been written, just a two little page leaflet which is not in detail. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking very seriously and people are forcing me to write an autobiography of a modern yogi. Hmm? Uh, and I'm thinking very seriously. I think I'm a bit too young. You know, uh, 71 is not much, is it? Mm -hmm, I'm not 71. 51. <laughs> 51, 51, 51, 51. But I feel as if I was born yesterday. Yeah. That's what happens to you, you know. You, you, you start developing the mind, the mind, the mind, then you start opening the heart, the heart, the heart, and then you become like a child. And you feel as if you were born yesterday. Huh? Fine. So then I met my guru, Swami Pavitranandji, and for eight months he took no notice of me. 
uh, at the ashram in Almora, right high up in the Himalayas, where you have the view of one of the highest peaks in the Himalayan range, the Nanda Devi. Mm. And early in the morning, my job was to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Being the youngest there, they were all retired swamis, retired teachers, gurus. And my job was to light the hookah pipes. Uh, you know what a hookah is? It's a water pipe. We have water in, inside, which acts as a filter. And there are pipes leading from it. You get large hookahs that are five tubes. So five people could sit around it and puff away. Hmm? And then you get those with one tube. And then you put in sugar mixed with molasses. And you put a burning curl. Now my job was to wake up at four in the morning and light them. Hmm? I used to enjoy some of the puffs myself. Look, how can you light it without puffing? I mean, stands to reason. Fine. Okay. So, uh, one morning I was late. You know, I woke up late, and uh, my guru comes along with a cane, starts slapping me in the backside. He says, come on, get out what you're lying here for. You should be up and about already. Hmm? He used to shout at me, a piece of paper lying there. He says, why the devil is that piece of paper lying there? Hmm, like that. I thought to myself, what kind of a guru is this? Bloomin' ass. Ah. Because I didn't understand what he was doing. I didn't understand what he was doing. Ah, but in reflection, I found out what he was doing. He was trying to break down my arrogance. Because brilliant student taking away all the prizes, mm, president's gold medal for poetry, mm, and this, that, and the other. Brilliant student producing the best plays for college. Mm. Every subject, an A. Mm. And all the girls falling around me. You know, it boosted up my ego. Mm. So what this Swamiji, this guru, who's, who has passed away, as a matter of fact, I was doing a course in England, and a telegram arrived in England that he had left his body. Mm. So uh, he had passed away. He's passed away now. He was 84 when he left his body. Uh, nevertheless, as I said, uh, in thinking back, I found out that he was trying to break down my arrogance, my pride, hmm? by these means, by ignoring me and by doing the various things he did. Hmm? And I realize now that he was a true guru. Hmm? It's not always a good doctor that gives you sweet medicines. A good doctor can give you bitter medicines as well to teach you. And then one day, all of a sudden, eight months later, he says, come, sit down, and meditate with me. And I sat down and meditated. Two hours passed away, and it seemed like just about two minutes to me. And when I came out of meditation, the entire place was covered with gold. Just gold, 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 right around. And that still persists with me today, here and now. I just see gold, 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 right around. Such beauty, shimmering. From that time, I've never seen anything to which I could say this is ugly. There's no ugliness. Everything is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when the awareness becomes expanded as vast as the universe, you just can't but help loving a thief, a rapist, a murderer. Because you do not look at the thief or the rapist or the murderer. You look right inside the person and recognize the divinity within that person, not in a sense of separation or dualism, but in a sense of oneness, for divinity is but one, and that one divinity that is in you is in me. Do you see? And that is how one goes through all the lessons of life to find release from the ego. Sometimes you, you are met up with adverse circumstances, and you say, why must this happen to me? Mm? 
Why must I drive about in a broken down little car huh, while my next door neighbor has a Cadillac? Mm, you say that, but take a walk a little further down the road. You might find a person with a bicycle. Hmm? And you still have a shackled down car. And take a walk still further down. And you find a man walking, no bicycle. And still a little walk further down, you might find a person in a wheelchair given to him by the government. He's got no legs. Huh? Do you see how infinite the mercy is of divinity? But it is only we that do not want to recognize that divinity is omnipresent everywhere and every creature on this earth, the meanest worm, is worthy of the love that you could have for your most precious beloved. Let's see what the time is. Good. So we can find something else here. Oh, the husband comes home tired. Hmm? He comes home tired and he just barely made it to his armchair and he flopped down. Terribly tired. So, of course, he's a good wife. Wives are always good. They are. I must tell you about them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she turns up with a nice tall glass of soft drinks for him. It was a hot day. She gives him this soft drink and she says, Darling, you must have had um, a very hard day today. Hmm? You must have had a very hard day today. Uh, you look so, so tired. So he says, Yes, love, love. That's the way they say it in England, in Liverpool, love. Uh. <laughs> you know, talking of England, the British flag, you know, red, white, and blue. Is that the color of your flag too? <coughs> Canadian flag? <laughs> red and white. Oh, well, the British flag, uh, red, white, and blue. You know, they like taxes. You know, that you pay the government taxes. Uh, when you think of taxes that you have to pay, you get red. Hmm? And when you pay them, you get white, livid white. When you pay them, and after you've paid the taxes, you feel very blue. <laughs> Good. So this man, he was tired. And then his husband comes with this lovely soft drink. Uh, and he says, darling, you look very tired. And she puts down this soft drink. Tell me what happened. So he says, do you know, at the office, all the computers broke down, and we all of us had to start thinking. <laughs> that is why he was tired. Isn't that happening to us? Are we really thinking? Or are we just messing around hmm, with thought, old thoughts and old patternings of the past or of the future? Hmm? Where is the thinking? No. Because real thinking is creative. Real thinking is optimistic, never pessimistic. Hmm? Yes, eh? and that's creative thinking. And some of you who are artists or musicians or any field of art, hmm? uh, Chetanji, have you got one of my chants? Yes, sir. Good. I'll give you a sample of a poem. You know what creativity is about. Hmm? Um, yes, so thinking. Very few people think. They think that they think, but they don't really think. 
you see, realize the difference. And one can reach beyond the levels of thought processes into the level of knowingness and all, thank you, and all actions performed are spontaneous. This is a poem uh, written last year sometime, I suppose. Uh, Guruaj began writing poetry in his early adolescence and has already received several awards in India by the age of 20. In fact, critics have favorably compared his work to Tagore's blah, 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 blah. Uh, ah, here we are. Let my love be measured by giving and not by gain. For if gain I sought, this life lived would be in vain. Love then yourself to lose, I say again and again, for the giver can only give as clouds disperse in rain. Filled and full as a teardrop on maiden cheek without stain, for heaving breasts heave, but to give all, all to her swain. The blushing bride can blush no more, Wheat becomes flowered grain. Sweetness of the sugar comes from crushed giving of the cane. Let my love be measured by giving and not by gain. For flowers too the fragrance give. Let me sing forever this refrain. Yeah, so if we make this life a life of giving, you'd always be the gainer. Hmm? Always the gainer. If you have a beautiful scent in the air now of roses, immediately your mind will go to roses. The rose has given of its fragrance. Hmm? spontaneously, without effort, and created so much joy in our hearts, should our lives not be like those flowers? Hmm? Should our lives not be like all nature around us? Hmm? For life itself is a celebration. Why all the misery and the unhappiness is created by the thought patterns? Bypass those thought patterns through spiritual practices. Dig that tunnel. Mm, bore through mm, to the superconscious level of the mind and find the light there, the stillness, and bring it down. Mm, into daily living, for all philosophy is but mental gymnastics if it cannot be translated into daily action, in daily living, whereby life becomes more joyous. So bore through the clutterings of the mind. It's so simple. You have the tools to do it. Use the tools, and life becomes a giving, a total giving. Mm -hmm. And then the result is this. You get away from suffering, and life becomes an offering. You get away from suffering, and life becomes an offering. For one thing I guarantee you is this that one step you take towards divinity, he that is divine takes ten steps towards you, enriching your life always. Mm, I've spoken for an hour and three quarter. Ah, good. Now, let us start with rapid-fire questions. Until six o'clock, we've got half an hour left. Fine. You were asking about spirits, something... Uh, going in and going out. What was that about? Um, it was about, uh, well, I mean, if you think in terms of uh, there's people that say that they have seen ghosts and, picked, and repeated people that they've seen this. And I was mm -hmm. If it is true or not. 
is true. If it is true, say if there is a spirit that is hanging around, if that is happening, if they are putting themselves on, or if the person themselves is just creating it or drawing that to make things that uh, Right. Now, there are ghosts, spooks. <laughs> Yeah, but not in the sense that people believe them to be. By ghosts, what we mean is this, that everything radiates. Hmm? Even this flowers radiating fragrance, this table because of the molecular motion in there, this body is forever radiating an energy. So even after uh, the soul has left the body, what you can see is the radiation which takes a bit of time to dissipate itself. It is totally harmless. It is just a radiation of the body. It's like switching off certain kinds of lights and you still find a bit of a glow. Hmm? And that is just a glow, the emanation from the body. Um, you can uh, put off the incense sticks that are burning, and yet there will be a smell of incense around in the room. So it is not harmful, and there are some people uh, can see them, some people that could take themselves to deeper levels of the subtle body, so they could see the subtle body or the emanation of the subtle body somehow. It is non-harmful. Right. Now, this second part of your question reverts around the word possession. No one can possess you. That is a fallacy. Hmm? And uh, that is why uh, they have people call Exorcists, is that the way you pronounce it? To exorcise you? There's no truth in that at all. Hmm? It is a mental imbalance where certain chemistry of the brain functions in a certain way where you bring forth to, you know, in your living state, in your waking state, where you bring forth certain characteristics and qualities of a life that you have lived previously. And the intermingling of the characteristics of this life and a previous life makes you feel that you are possessed by some spirit which is not true at all. It is because of this mental imbalance that uh, makes you think that you are possessed by spirits. There is no possession at all. What a good exorcist would do is make you feel that he's taken the spirit away, the evil spirit that has possessed you, hmm? and which in reality is not true. It is just a psychological ruse. It's like what the doctors do nowadays hmm, for psychosomatic diseases. They give you a placebo. You've heard of the word, hmm, where a pill contains nothing but aspirin powder in a lovely capsule and says, ah, oh, this will fix you up. And it does fix you up. Yeah, it makes your mind believe that you're getting better. That's all. And that is how the person becomes unpossessed. Hmm? So there is no possession. No fear of that at all. And that is why psychiatrists today cannot understand schizophrenia, for example. And I've attended many schizophrenic cases where thoughts become so dominant because of attachment there again, you know, of a past life just brimming through the structure of the present individualized little mind. Hmm? And that is what schizophrenia is all about. And of course, psychiatrists today, what they do uh, uh, when they can't find anything uh, to help the patient with, they might inject you with modulin right into the brain and other things like that. And then when they can't, then they do a hit and run thing by giving you electric shock treatment, just thinking that those neurons firing, they might just fall into place. 
but it's experimental and nothing, nothing definite. Hmm? And all these problems, psychosomatic problems, asthmatic problems, heart problems, blood pressure, migraine, oh, I could go on and on and on, can be reduced and cured and helped. Hmm? Uh, all things like alcoholism and you know, drug abuse and all these things can be lessened and cured by a very simple form of meditation and spiritual practices where you flood your entire being with divinity and your action becomes good, hmm? good for yourself and for others. Huh? This is it. Next question. Yes. Oh, sorry, whoever. Ladies first, okay, right. Three gunas. Ah, three gunas, yes, that's the. Uh, of individual and each other's perhaps larger aspects of it. With creation and discovery. Uh, the three gunas, the three gunas are the essential qualities. It's a very, very vast subject, really. But to put it very briefly to you, are the three essential qualities that uh, comprise this entire universe. The three gunas are sattva, rajas, and tamas. Sattva is the guna or substance of light and activity, while tamas is the substance of nescience, darkness, and inertia. And rajas is the quality of activation. So the activating quality rajas are forever, ever trying to bring about sattva to overpower tamas, forever trying to bring light over darkness, and this causes a certain kind of expansion and contraction which gives motion to the entire universe. Now, Rajas, Sattva and Tamas also exists in our little individual selves, uh, and even our thought formations are based upon that. Everything is based upon this trinity. Hmm? What you refer to as creation and destruction, according to Hindu mythology, that's something different, where they regard Brahma, the creator, uh, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the dissolver. And so uh, that's a different thing altogether. But the three constituents of the entire universe is Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva. And the Rajas being the activating force tries to overcome the inertia by activity, overcome darkness by light. There are very deep philosophies and these three principles um, uh, can be discussed in various aspects. This trinity of this force forever trying to combine and bring to an equilibrium the forces that are in tamas, darkness, and sattva, which is light. So it is an equilibrating force which is forever there and not separate from rajas and tamas, but interpenetrating both. They have been eternal as the primal manifestation and forever will be, was, is, and will be as the manifestation of the subtle mind, which was the primal manifestation of the manifesta, and the primal mind further condensed itself into this matter, which is called rajas, tamas, and sattva which again in turn grossified itself into all the elements we see around us. Hmm? So through meditational practices, you go beyond all these uh, relative, beyond all relativity, all these uh, relative things, and reach the area where 
you find the joy of the all-pervading, all-consuming, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent spirit. And that spirit abides in the just for the recognition. Uh, the umbrella name of our organization is the International Foundation for Spiritual Unfoldment. Mark the word unfoldment, not development. For as you are, you are fully developed. Hmm? But all these veils of the ego, of nescience, of darkness, of tamas, covering the light, hmm? has to be removed one by one until the pure light remains. And that is the joy, the purpose, the goal of all humanity. Mm. Um, this fellow says to his friend, they were in, in a mountain log cabin, and he says, Horace, I'm surprised you're not married. Hmm? So Horus says, you know, I would have been. So he says, well, tell me the story. He says, you know, I met a beautiful blonde. I took, I liked her and I took her home to meet my mother. And um, my mother didn't like the way she talked. So then I found another girl. Hmm? It was a lovely redhead, and um, I took her to my mother, and this redhead was a hillbilly singer, and she, my mother didn't like the way she dressed and acted and behaved, so that was the end of the second love story, second love affair. So then he decided, he says, let me try and find someone just like mother. <clears throat> So he meets a girl who looked very similar to her mother, to his mother. She talked like his mother, more or less. She walked like his mother, yeah, and the mother liked her. So the friend asked, Horace, if your mother liked her, what went wrong? Why didn't you marry her? He says, well, I would have married her, mother liked her, but dad could not stand the sight of her. <laughs> uh, yes, this fellow couldn't get married either, you know. So he says, um, when I'm drunk, she would not accept my proposal. And when I'm sober, I cannot propose. <laughs> Good, next question. Did you have your hand up? Uh, yeah. mm? I have two or three questions, I'll jumble that. Uh, in, 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 in your initiation that you get, um, why don't you just briefly describe where, what, what is happening in the initiation and also what your what the guru's role is in the unfoldment of the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what happens, I said this morning that initiations, were you here this morning? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that the initiation takes, uh, is done in two parts. You get the preparatory technique that prepares you for the full techniques, which are tailor-made to you, custom-made. Fine, if you wear a size 38 suit, a 42 size is no good, and neither is a size 32, it must be your size. Now, um, all the initiations are done by me personally, and as I explained, I use the photograph as a focal point and then I go into deep meditation and get to your vibratory level. And from there, analyzing that, um, your special practices are personally chosen by me. 
and this is happening throughout the world. In Canada, we call it Canadian Meditation Society in America, the American in Spain, the Spanish in Britain, the British, Germany, the German, like that all over. We use the country's name. Fine. Uh, in Canada, of course, they've been registered now as a non-profit making under federal laws, as a non-profit making institution. So now we have teachers here, uh, which is, we are just about newly started here, and we have teachers here who have been taught how to teach the practices that I've prescribed. For example, here in Vancouver, we have Hugh Hunt sitting over there, yeah, Hugh Hunt, uh, who has a top government post as a civil engineer, and his wife Barbara, who was a nurse, but of course she's a housewife now, she's a little baby, she doesn't go to work anymore, fine. Um, then we have Larry Owens sitting over there, uh, he's a, a schoolmaster of a high school, uh, those are the teachers here in the Victoria area. And then, of course, in Vancouver, we have Carl Walter sitting in the corner there, right? That's for the Vancouver people. And he's a semi-retired business tycoon. <coughs> <laughs> he used to be in the, in, in the real estate business. Um, he's semi-retired, and, of course, he spends such a lot of time, for example, organizing this tour you must, you might have seen the itinerary. Uh, it was a lot of, lot of work. You know, all the correspondence and oh, I don't know how he did it. I would have been driven nuts. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, he's there. And then, of course, we have Leslie Janos. There's Leslie sitting next to the gong. Uh, he's a concert pianist, yeah, and also he teaches the piano. And he's done some wonderful concerts on tour. Hmm? And oh, by the way, uh, Carl is a musician as well. Uh, he used to play uh, uh, in a symphony as a violinist. Hmm? Was it the first fiddle or the second fiddle? No third, I see. This one man was asked, do you, do, do you play any music? So he says, yes. Uh, well, I play music at home. What instrument do you play? The second fiddle, he said. <laughs> Um, then, of course, uh, we come to Caroline, who is uh, Leslie's wife, and uh, she's got a BA in um, uh, humanities. She's a teacher, and uh, she also is one of the finest flutists or flautists, whatever, uh, however you pronounce it, in Vancouver. She's a great flute player, and perhaps sometimes when we get together and we have a, a piano somewhere, <laughs> piano. Uh, I'm sure Leslie would love to regale you with his wonderful music, and so would Caroline with her flute. She teaches flute and also... Um, so what I'm trying to point out to you is this, that uh, our organization, uh, we don't... Uh, we are not weirdos. Hmm? You know, weird people with long beards and, you know, shaving off their hair and I don't know what else they do. We're not a bunch of weirdos. Highly respectable, responsible people that have found in their lives the great benefits of our systems of meditation, our universal philosophy of love and peace, how to look at things from a different perspective. So it's not only theory, but also the practice that goes with the theory, because there has to be both, or otherwise, it's lopsided. Mm. Uh, for example, if it was just theory, then there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of professors of philosophy in the world, uh, and I know quite a number of them lecturing at various universities. Um, and although they've studied every philosophy, but I find them themselves so mixed up. Mm. Yes, in spite of studying all those philosophies. So uh, it is not just mental gymnastics or rationalization, because everything we do, we do logically. I mean, we don't do things illogically, and we want to understand everything we do. And our teachers are very qualified to answer any question you have. Hmm? Um, for example, uh, uh, Hugh Hunt, the civil engineer, 
uh, he was the president of, uh, of an organization that also dealt with spiritual and meditational matters for 19 years until he met me a few years ago, two, three years ago, and he found that uh, there's some value, greater value. Like I used to use palm oil of soap for many years and I found it good until I discovered body dust. Hmm? So, uh, so you find something better and you, you try that something better. Yes, see. So here we have a council that runs the Canadian Meditation Society. They're all voluntary workers. They, they don't draw a penny pay for anything, but they work as a service to humanity to spread the word of love, peace, and joy, and how to attain it. That's important. Hmm? The words, many people speak, you know, words, 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 but nothing said. That's not good. How to attain, how to reach the goal, that's important. Hmm? Good. Any? Ah, yes. Would your, Dorji, would your practices conflict with uh, other spiritual practices we may have been taught? Uh, which other spiritual practices you do? Hmm? Which one do I do? No, no, no. With yeah. any, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, I tell you one thing. If you are a Christian, I'd like you to become a better Christian. There's no conversion at all. If you are a Buddhist, I would like to see you a better Buddhist a Hindu, a better Hindu, in other words, a better human being. But when you do practices, it's no use going to three different doctors and taking a bottle of medicine from this one and that one and that one and mixing all three different medicines which might be detrimental to you. It reminds me of a little story. Uh, this bird was sitting on the mast of a ship and the bird was in a hurry to reach the shore. So it flew to the east, and the shore was too far away, so it flew back and sat on the mast, rested. Then it flew to the west, and the same problem, the coast was too far, and it came back, and it tried the north and south, and the same problem. So at last the bird decided that let me stick to the mast and rest here, for the ship will definitely reach shore. Hmm? instead of me flying this way and that way and that way, finding the shore. It is always a good policy not to mix your practices. You stick to one thing, right? And by sticking to one thing, you'll find the maximum benefit. And, of course, I always say, the proof of the pudding lies in the eating. The pudding could be very beautiful, but might not taste nice. The proof of the pudding lies in the eating. And that is why we have all these thousands and thousands of meditators and practitioners, people on the path to divinity around the world. Good. Shall we adjourn now till tomorrow morning? Huh? Because I think I've got to see some people. Larry, you have a list for me of people to see. Good. It's been such fun today being with all of you. Mm? Uh, all of you is the wrong expression, being with all of me.